a new menace could make such imports unnecessary. Crooked chemists in California are making synthetic drugs, heroin without poppies, cocaine without coca leaves, homemade designer drugs of immense power. The new drugs can be so potent that a smudge of the undiluted product on a fingertip could kill a man. Back in 2012, there was a series of stories that by the mid-2020s, we would all be using 3D printers to create our own drugs at home. Our laptops would become our drug dealers, the police would be powerless to stop it, and the war on drugs would simply die away in the face of a generation of computer nerds coding their own cocaine. Flash forward a decade and this prediction looks increasingly like it's going to turn out to be complete nonsense. Today, at the risk of looking stupid in a few years ourselves, we're going to think about what might happen next in the future of drugs. For the last few thousand years, most of the drugs humanity has used, from cannabis and cocaine to heroin and alcohol, have had one thing in common. They're all ultimately made from plants. But this might be about to change. Perhaps the most dramatic transformation we may see over the next few years is an increasing shift from plant-based to entirely synthetic drugs. Synthetic opioids such as fentanyl have completely transformed the US opioid market. The Mexican drug traffickers decided that it was a lot cheaper to import fentanyl from Chinese labs and put that in heroin deals instead of actually heroin because you got a lot more bangs for your buck and resulted in huge increase in the amount of people overdosing from drugs. Hold it down to literally two overdoses a month and the rate I'm going, I may not see 32. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid roughly 100 times stronger than morphine. Its analog, carfentanyl, is about 100 times stronger than that. Some of these people died so quickly that they hadn't got time to pull the syringes out of their arms. And carfentanyl is 10,000 times stronger than heroin by volume. It, it's so potent that it, it's impossible to use safely on human beings, and you can get enough under your fingernail to kill you. These are the drugs that have been driving the horrific rise in drug overdoses across North America. And this development was not unforeseen. The researcher G.L. Henderson predicted the growth of fentanyl and its analogues in a paper all the way back in 1988. Perhaps if politicians had listened to experts instead of hysterical media reports, hundreds of thousands of lives may have been saved. But that's not how the war on drugs tends to work. And when it comes to the rising tide of synthetics, authorities are still largely turning to the same failed methods of control. What's happened recently in the last couple of years, the US have put pressure on China and now China has clamped down on the production of fentanyl. But all the Mexican cartels are doing is that they're now receiving the ingredients that are used to make fentanyl um, and they're getting trafficked over from China because the Mexicans know they got some very talented cooks there, very highly rated, and they can literally make anything. This is one of the fundamental dynamics of the war on drugs. As governments try to clamp down on a particular substance, the dealers shift to stronger and more dangerous versions of that substance. We see this exact same pattern in the development of other synthetic drugs, like spice and bath salts, that have attracted so many media horror stories over the past few years. There was a time when methadrone and synthetic cannabis were actually quite decent drugs. Ever since those drugs were banned and banned and banned and the more extreme their replacements became, the market is being flooded increasingly with cheap, highly profitable chemicals that are easier to manufacture. So you don't have to wait for these things to grow in a field. And uh, they don't really seem to be caring about their uh, customers sort of dropping dead. With drug deaths in the US at record highs, the thought of ever more powerful synthetic opioids pouring into this market is pretty terrifying. But there do seem to be some indications that in the US, some of this danger might actually be starting to hit home. It was America that first initiated the global war on drugs and has been forcing it on the world ever since. But somewhat ironically, it's also in America that people now seem to be beginning to reevaluate the whole drug war itself. So this total normalcy now for marijuana is such a contrast to back when I first had some involvement in the war on drugs. And one of the important points to note is that as legalization of pot has proceeded, the sky has not fallen. 
Medicinal marijuana is now legal in 34 of our 50 states. And of those, 15 have also legalized adult use. All the things that people were so ostensibly afraid about, like teen use, traffic accidents, those just have not borne out. And the money from the tax revenue is rolling in. Since its very beginning, drug prohibition in the US has been built on prejudice. Drug enforcement has become the main vehicle through which racism is expressed in criminal justice. And this might be another darkly ironic factor in why the US may now be starting to wind back the war on drugs. Certainly the opioid crisis, a lot of the victims of this are white. They are often the children or relatives of white voters. And as long as drug problems could be seen as an inner city minority problem with people who mostly don't vote, the larger voting population could pretty much ignore it. But suddenly this is coming home to a lot of middle class white neighborhoods. If the momentum of this winding back of certain aspects of the war on drugs does continue, it's going to have profound impacts across American society in terms of racial justice, economic equality, and not least in fundamentally reconsidering the role of law enforcement. This militarization of our police that has been going on since the late 1990s. 1998 was something called the, it's referred to as the 1033 program. And under this, the U.S. Defense Department gives surplus military battlefield equipment to local police and sheriffs. Now, I didn't see much of this kind of thing when I was with the Army in Afghanistan. So you get these military wannabes, mostly poorly trained, and they start seeing themselves as an occupying army. And the result had been a lot of people get killed. You know, you don't need a battering ram for community policing. President Obama threw an executive order to put a few restrictions on this, such as no grenade launchers. <laughs> President Trump, by another executive order, removed those restrictions. Well, one of his first acts as president, Joe Biden, by executive order, reversed the Trump decisions. So now we're back to Obama. I see that as a step in the right direction, but what is really needed is statutory change, just simply to get rid of this program. These developments in the US are significant, but they're also just the very first baby steps in ending the war on drugs. Decades of just say no propaganda, racist law enforcement, and mass incarceration are not gonna go away overnight. But there's also the entire rest of the world to think about. While potential legalization in the US might have profound effects on producer and transit countries in Central and South America, Europe may well be slower in its pace of reform because of differences in the structure of political systems. Countries such as the UK and other countries in Europe, they're not made up of lots of almost autonomous states like they are in America. Cornwall in the UK can't suddenly decide that it wants to legalise weed it simply just would not be allowed to do it, nor would Corsica in France or whatever else. And while Europe may lag behind the US, there are also plenty of countries consciously moving in the opposite direction. If you do drugs in my city, I will kill you. Opposed to any reform of drug laws and ramping up their enforcement with ever harsher regimes, which will very likely have similarly disastrous consequences for their own citizens as prohibition has had in the West in sort of 10 years time, if that keeps on happening, you will have a, a completely and utterly divided world where one side of the world is completely anti-drugs and the other side of the world is legal drugs. The drug trade follows the same trends and shifts as any other major global industry. And almost no shift has been more important in world trade over the past few decades than globalization. That means that Europe may well soon be facing its own synthetic drugs crisis, but a very different one to what's currently tearing America apart. Europe might be about to discover crystal meth. What's happened is that Mexican chemists connected to cartels like the Sinaloa cartel have been found in laboratories in Holland. They're teaching the Dutch how to make cheaper, stronger, better, faster crystal methamphetamine. They're making shards as big as your arm, so you've got chunks of crystal meth this big, you know. Yeah, most of this is actually being exported currently to Australia and Japan. Proper crystal meth is 300 Australian dollars a gram. Now this is walking out the factory at $13 a gram in Holland. So you're looking at big, big markup, even a small bit. Mexican cooks teaching Dutch chemists how to make pure methamphetamine for sale in Asia 
is an interesting globalization story in itself. But it seems grimly inevitable that with this much meth being produced in Europe, local use will start increasing. And once again, this is tied to larger economic realities. You know, people are losing their jobs everywhere across the EU. There's you know, a huge uptick in precarious jobs with zero hour contracts. And you know, the economic downturn that will inevitably follow the COVID-19 pandemic, I can definitely see crystal meth use increasing. And there are pockets of it emerging, just pockets in the UK, man. But it is inevitable, I think, that this drug will gain in popularity simply because of its price, its efficacy and its availability. This last point also brings us to the other great inescapable transformation of global business over the past two decades, the internet. While 3D printing our own drugs at home may be a while off yet, technologies like the dark web are undoubtedly changing how people buy and sell drugs. And that trend is only going to continue to grow no matter what moves the police try to make against it. The innovation in darknet markets is already here. And we've seen that with the rise of the Televent services as a series of bot agents that are layered on top of the Telegram app in your phone. The Bitcoin payments and the encryption and decryption of all of the back end stuff is now done by a robot. And very quickly in like the space of like five keystrokes by any amount of any drug that you want to be delivered to your house in the next day or two in most countries in Europe. Yeah, it's, uh, it's 2021 and you can buy ecstasy for robots. I think that's something like progress. So we've got Mexican cartels in the Netherlands pouring meth into Europe, a world flooded with ultra powerful synthetic opioids and people buying crack from robots over the phone. All while the US is seemingly starting to reconsider its approach to the war on drugs. If the hundred odd years of the war on drugs teaches us anything, it's that the more that things appear to change, the more the underlying patterns stay the same. People want to use drugs, and when governments use force and repression to stop them, it never, ever works. And it's pretty much always the poor, marginalized, and vulnerable who suffer the most. We'd like to congratulate drugs for winning the war on drugs.